You guys give me like a nod. Can you even hear? No. Can you hear? They can't. That's fine. You're good. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce Elizabeth, but uh, normally I don't do a little write-up like this, so if I'm not looking up at you, because I'm trying really hard to read this small type, I apologize. Please forgive me. Um, okay. You ready? I'm ready. Uh, so our guest this evening is an award-winning designer, writer, artist, and researcher. Uh, in an industry that's created countless games that explore ruins of ancient civilizations and cultures, uh, be it metaphorically or literally, her work represents the way the very voice that games as a medium can have to relate real-world civilizations and cultures to users uh, in an engaging, innovative, uh, and thought-provoking way. I totally messed up. I'm trying way too hard. I almost, I almost did, but I didn't. It was great. It was very thoughtful. Okay. That was, that was the best introduction I've ever received. So. Thank you. Oh, 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 Jesus. No. This is not, no. I totally messed that up. Everybody should be like, no, really? Like any critique that you give me in class now should just be like, totally no. Anyway. It was thoughtful. Seriously. Like, you actually care. Nobody actually does care. Just like, here's the bio. We should do like a comedy duo. This is good. Anyway. Oh. Oh. So while they're doing that, I'll just awkwardly continue to apologize. You want me to try again? Oh yeah. Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Mars Ash, and I run the game art program here. Most of you know me, but for those on YouTube, hi. How's it going? Okay. Yeah, there was some point about how games are all about ruins and, huh? What? What? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody messed up. It was me. Blame it on him. It's me. Okay. Just let me go. I'm like a horse chomping at the bit here. Right, but. Oh. Are you good? <laughs> so how's everybody? Just do like. Good? Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, this is. I could worst. find my way through the presentation. No, because we're ready now, right? <laughs> we're good? Thumbs up? Oh, good. Oh, Great. Good. Let's welcome Elizabeth LaPonce. Ani? Uh, I am being really explicit with the text because this is what I was guided to do, to be very clear about what I'm presenting on tonight. So I am both Anishinaabe and Métis, and my family is from the Great Lakes, from Bawating area, uh, and I'm closest related to uh, Sault Ste. Marie, as well as Bay Mills Indian community. So I will be talking to you tonight, I hope as briefly as possible, because I would like mainly to get questions and to interact with you more because I don't get out much. So this is the opportunity to actually like interact with people. And I will be talking about enacting sovereignty through game design, which I do in my work. Now, the important thing to understand here is what does sovereignty mean? In the context of being indigenous, usually it actually means being taken advantage of. We were told we were sovereign. There were treaties which were presented, signed by both sides and by the queen's side, and by indigenous communities, and the intention was to honor those treaties, but they were not. Now, I answer to elders like Carol Najwan, who still use this term sovereignty as a means of taking it back. So what sovereignty is supposed to mean is that we have power, that you have power, I have power, and that we have a negotiation or a collaboration. So in the context of game design, when I use the term sovereignty, I mean when I'm making a game, it can be by and for my community, and if a community determines that nobody else gets to play that game, that's their decision. Because of that, I've gone down a career path where I rely also on academic funding. So that the decisions that I make in terms of design don't rely on everyone being able to play, trying to make big sales. 
It's actually first and foremost about the design itself and about the core mechanics and how do those reflect the needs or wants of the community and our teachings. How are those being passed on? That's the kind of work that I do. Now, there are other indigenous game developers who do like all kinds of different work and the mechanics may or may not reflect indigenous teachings. So for example, how many of you are familiar with Doom? Yeah. Okay, well Doom was created in part by John Romero, who's Yaqui and Cherokee. And at times I've had conversations with him where I theorize from those that the expansion of our understanding of space in games in part came from the fact that he is indigenous and was raised around ceremonies and then he self-taught himself coding by going into like stores. Can you imagine like a time when if you were like a kid and you hung out at a store and you're like, can I just hang out on this computer and code for hours? Like, I don't know if that would necessarily happen anymore. So on the one hand, people say, games are so much more accessible and we have engines like Unity 3D and everybody can make games. But on the same note, there were ways in which uh, there was a self-determination and a kind of openness, right? That it certainly would not exist in a computer store today. I don't think they'd be like, yeah, kid, just hang out on our equipment all the time. That's cool. So John Romero then helped to define how we move through space in games. The teachings I was raised with are that uh, are very dimensional oriented. Uh, the science that we relate and our physics are closest to quantum physics. And so that's the kind of work I'm most excited about. Now, ironically, having said that, I do 2D work primarily and so far largely because I've lived out in the bush where like I can't even stream SoundCloud without getting a limitation put on me and I don't get internet anymore if I go over a certain limit and I've got to drive 30 minutes down to town to send my files to other team members, do what I can off the Wi-Fi out of the library, <laughs> and then ride back up the hill another 30 minutes and go in these kinds of cycles. For the last, um, I did go uh, get a PhD in Vancouver, British Columbia, so I had access to technology and like full on internet then. But for the most part, I've been really on and off other places out on a reservation, Beaver Lake Cree Nation in Alberta, again, same sort of limitations. And so I would ask myself questions like, why would I want to make a game that no one on reservations could play, right? So I answer primarily to my communities and then to other indigenous communities, understanding that we are primarily on the other side of the digital divide. And I focus then on games which can be downloaded, in some kind of space and can be played offline. And I've noticed more and more these trends towards even mobile games requiring active internet access, even though you've downloaded the game, you have it on your phone, you don't need to. And so there's this tethering that's happening. And so a lot of my work is about resisting that. Now that's not to say that I'll never work on 3D or other kinds of dimensional games. And the fact of it is that now that I'm at Michigan State University and do have access to amazing equipment, I am starting to work in virtual reality. But I still think that there's a lot of weight to be had in accessibility. Then too comes in the piece of collaboration. When I make games, this is from Honor Water, I make um, a lot of the art in the games that I work on. It depends, it varies. But no one in industry was ever going to give me a shot to do anything other than background art, right? And they hire me as a writer very often, or they would hire me as a cultural consultant. And very quickly, that can turn into using someone of diversity as a token. Because you end up on this big team, and they already have their ideas of what they want, and they bring you in very often later in the game. And you're there primarily so that they can check their boxes and they can say, well, we did have a conversation about that. But in the long run, how much autonomy do you really have because you're not the one managing the money, okay? And this has happened not just to me, but to many people of diversity. 
within game industry and then you know, even in kind of smaller game teams. And so when I'm collaborating with indigenous communities, I want that relationship to be different. In a sovereign context, that means it's reciprocal. So this art comes from the game Honor Water. It's a singing game where uh, it passes on Anishinaamon, which is my language. And right away, we ran into a bit of a, I'd say just like a, like a conversation about games. And so originally, this comes from the singing game Singuistics. And there were elders involved in that, grandmothers, who said, we don't want a game that gives potentially negative feedback when people are singing and speaking the language, because they already went through that. They already went through the loss of language and shaming around language through residential schooling systems. So is that what they want to do to the next generations? No, because what would happen in a singing game? You might sing something incorrectly, and the game's going to be like, what? Ah, you're wrong. You fail. You're a loser. Try again. But maybe, you know, I mean, there's like these cycles. And they were like, no, 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 no. That's not a good way to go. And so effectively, there ended up being no direct feedback system in this game. And then I was like, is it even a game then? If well, like, what is the win condition, right? Like, if I can't be like, I won this song, and I got this many points, like, is that a game? Yes, it's still a game because you're entering a space which is gameful, which is playful, which helps break the barrier of shame with language. And so, when I work on language games, not just this one, but on others. You can interact with the language. You can touch it. You can look at the root. You can then explore it more and understand the basis of our language, which is uh, primarily descriptive and action-oriented, not object-oriented. So um, a good example in English would be uh, if you had a cup. Uh, in English, you would say the cup or cup. But in my language, you would say uh, it relative to where you are, potentially. So the cup which is this distance away from me, or the cup which belongs to this person, or the cup which belongs to me. And that's all one word. So there's a complexity within the phrases, which can be expressed through games. Now, by that same right, then, when I was working on Honor Water, there are water songs which are considered sacred in this game. And the question comes up then, can we sing sacred songs across many different players? Can we open up this knowledge to many different people? And this work was already happening because Sharon Day and the Oshki Gijik singers were involved in this game. And they were, at that point, releasing a CD of water songs which had been written with the purpose of being able to be shared with all people. And so this game is not in any kind of way breaking protocol or questioning or putting any kind of knowledge at risk, because this comes from specific community members who do want to open up certain pathways of knowledges and teachings, because we are at such a state of crisis with water that it is vital for all people to be engaged in water and even through gameplay. And so that's the kind of work that I do. Games which reflect our teachings, but also within the design. In that game, you see grandmother mechanics, is what I refer to it as. Games which tell you, just keep going. Like, try again. It never tells you you're wrong. It just tells you, keep on trying. The latest game I worked on is called Thunderbird Strike. Uh, it is much more reflective of collaborations, but then also very much so my voice as well. And uh, there is work also represented in here from a uh, Métis artist, Dylan Miner, who's also at Michigan State University. Some of you may be familiar with his work, as well as an Anishinaabe storyteller and artist, Isaac Murdoch. And the Thunderbird stories are being expressed from stories I grew up with, stories my mom told me and my auntie told me. and stories from many different family members and communities. There are many different forms of Thunderbird stories, and there are many different versions of Thunderbirds across many different nations. 
One of the stories that's being shared right now in light of pipelines being put through is that there will come a time when there will be a black snake which will threaten to swallow the lands and waters whole. And Thunderbirds are intricately woven into this story in the sense that they will be called upon for help to make motion to protect the earth. That there will be fires, there will be floods, there will be changes in the weather, uh, and that eventually the land will cave in on itself, which nobody really wants to have happen. This is something that reflects on all of us, right? So in terms of my own practice and what goes into my work, it's really dumb, actually. It's like, if you're like, I really want a way to suffer, then you're like, that's the way I'm going to do it. And so I hand draw everything. Yeah. And this piece in and of itself is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six layers of drawings. And then I individually scan each page. And then I put it in Photoshop. I do all of my stop motion animations in an experimental way, in a really probably stupid way. I do them all in Photoshop, primarily clicking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he supports me. Clicking, uh, he's like, it's OK. He sees me do this. Um, just clicking the arrow keys. And so like every time there's a motion, I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Pause, flatten, export, unflatten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, the reasons for this process are a bit twisted. I was in a like not super great uh, relationship where I was not allowed to create. My paints were taken from me. My canvases were taken from me. Everything was hidden from me. And so I was in a situation where I had to hide that I was creating. And so I built a process which worked for me which was what can I do that's silent and hidden? What can I do that's safe? What can I do that I can say, don't worry, I'm working on work that's going to pay the bills and everything else, because I was the primary income. But at the same time, I could still create. That's something that was embedded in me, oh gosh, starting, I don't even know, at least eight years ago. Well, no, 10 years ago, because you're nine now. And so that was a part of my life experience. And I understand at times, like as an artist, you're like, let's learn the new software and let's do new techniques and all this. But there are things that happen during these animations, ways in which layers fade and come in and come out, that just would not be possible if you were tweening, because you wouldn't think to do it. And that's very often what I'm doing with my work is that I'm showing that there are other ways in which we can create that do not rely on these systems that inform us about what our work is supposed to look like. And then in that sense, it can be unique. And it can stand out in this way. So this is a, uh, just like level one of um, Thunderbird Strike. You're welcome to check out the game itself. That's the best way to see it. Now, I was being a super artiste about this, and I was like, I want to make a game with no UI so that you're just immersed in the art, man. And then it turns out gamers really get it. People who don't, who like need a UI, actually really do need a UI. And so I'll have to tell people, just imagine there's a 45 degree angle on the lightning, and you have to strike right before. You can't be above, and you can't be after yeah. your targets. And then they get it. There's a certain flow to the game. and so. As an artist, it was what I wanted, right? And I made that decision. And I was able to make that decision because I have worked my career to such a state where this was created from an arts grant. And so that's the emphasis first and foremost. That's a benefit to me and to my work so that I can do that. And that's what sovereignty means. I get to do it in my own way, right? And this is level two. Now. This game got some attention because you do in the game strike lightning down at mining company buildings and big giant mining trucks. A bit of unwanted yeah, a bit of unwanted attention. And it turned out that uh, oil lobbyists were not so fond of that. Now, the thing of it is, you can also strike lightning at wolves, caribou, buffalo, 
and people, and you can either bring them back to life with their bones, or you can activate them into being. But, of course, the oil lobbyists aren't really going to look at that. Also found out it's very easy for Fox News to just show <laughs> when you're striking lightning at the pipelines. Oh, man. And so before you knew it, within one week, I had gotten targeted by an oil lobbyist group, won an award at the leading uh, festival for me in my career. It's like the most meaningful award for me, I think, ever. It'll be like this is it. I've, I've peaked for life. It was at the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. And that means the most to me because those are my peers. Like, that's my community, like my indigenous media community. And so they didn't know about one another. Like, this was all happening at the same time. So it wasn't like, because people have asked, like, didn't win an award and that's why the oil lobbyists went after you? Or, like, no, it all happened at the same time, just like. <laughs> and I was like, yay, I won an award. But I couldn't be at that event because my auntie passed this fall. And when we're in mourning, we don't travel. So I wasn't there to accept the award. And right as I got this award, same time, I started to get accused of being an eco-terrorist and of encouraging eco-terrorism with my work, which, you know, is like a serious federal offense. That's like not something you just say. And, uh, and, then, the, and then the hate mail, you know, and the things. And they tried to go after me at Michigan State University first. They tried to affiliate MSU with the game. Because I had given them a thank you because I'm a professor. And I'm like, high five, guys. Thanks. But I had completely created the game on my own equipment with my own art grant that I had gotten in Minnesota. And then that's where they got me. They were like, tax, payer money went into this? Yes, it did. It did go into this. Like. $3,459 or so. And a Minnesota senator decided that it was important enough for him to try to get that money back from me. And then, you know, talk about me on Fox News and everything. So all of a sudden, I was in a situation where the news blew up on Fox News. I'm getting whatever kind of craziness from oil lobbyists. And then I get audited. My art grant gets audited. And here's the deal, guys. It was a fellowship. And fellowships are usually like, here's money. Go be an artist. Enjoy. They want a report, but like, you know, it's, it's like a fellowship. It's for your career. And thank goodness I keep like good paperwork, although it was kind of ironic because I had been going through the Bank of America for all of the, the money. And like, because of divesting money from banks which support oil, I had shut down that bank account from the time that I had gotten the grant. And so by the time I was audited, I had to like go back to Bank of America like, hey, so like, can I get those records? Like, I know I closed that account and this is really awkward, but you know. So that happened. In the course of this, what I learned was that there are people in the game development community who would back me, right? So they went straight to the oil lobbyists, and they got them on record admitting that they had never actually played the game, right? None of these people had ever actually played the game, which is an important part of the story. They were purely going after me because of an idea. And if that idea had enough power to draw that much attention, OK, fine, right? Media doesn't necessarily help me. Yeah, the game got a lot more downloads, I mean, and, and international outreach. To the point where, like, I mean, I was distributing this on Dropbox, you guys. OK? Like, this was not like, yay, it's like fully released on Steam and everything. This is like, who wants to download my game? And I thought, like, maybe 10 people would download it. And then before I knew it, the link was crashing. And I had to, like, pay for an account. Because, like, who wants to pay for Dropbox? I guess I have to now. So. Yeah, OK, all right. So all of these things were happening. And I was like, whoa, man, like, no, like, I'm just a little indie underdog over here. Like, I'm not ready for this. This is not what I'm in this for. And it was all exciting and thrilling. And involved things, thank you, here's my sidekick here, and involved things like then um, really looking at the game and seeing, like, OK, because at the time the attack happened, this was like a PC download. Like, it was not even like, mob like a mobile release yet. And I was like, all right, 
What do I do with this situation? Got audited, proved I was in the right, so everything's fine. And then went through the process of determining, do I like release this on mobile? Because at that point, I had to change my number. I was starting to get like weird phone calls at like 4.30 in the morning, which is like not a time anyone calls. It's kind of weird. And I was just, you know, I was offered services by MSU police, which is great. Like they can track emails incoming. They can, you know, track your phone. And so I did have potential support, but I was just like, not really up for this battle. And then I was like, you know, let's just do this. Let's just release it on mobile and see what happens. Why not? And so I did. And at that point, it was more like getting attacked by individuals. And it's never gone away. The game released in October and won the award in October. And since then, it still comes up. Um, just two nights ago, um, someone affiliated with a group, I will not name by name, but I'm sure anyone who is a part of game communities will know who I'm talking about, people who have hackers, uh, tried to simultaneously get into my Instagram and my Twitter, and almost did, actually. But because I have two-way authentication, it was fine. So I just did another password sweep. So it's like I regularly now have to do regular password changes all across the board. I've learned a lot about cybersecurity. I've learned that as artists, if you're going to express your voice in games, that part of having your own self-determination and having your own power is actually preempting that. Like we shouldn't continuously, especially as women, be put in situations where we're like reacting to. We actually have to be more prepared and know. And so there are actually like set steps which everyone can take to be more secure. And so that's something that has been a process for me is understanding how do I take my own power back the latest was um, in January, they um, went really low bar, and they went to the Lansing State Journal, and um, the Lansing State Journal published an opinion piece about me uh, referring to me as attacking low-income families. Who knew? So, <laughs> mic drop. So because the eco-terrorism accusation didn't pan out, which by the way is also a term very often used to go after protectors who are at, for example, Standing Rock. How many of you are familiar with Standing Rock? Okay, a good number of you. And so um, those sorts of terms are coming up then in regards to me, right? So, um, so that happened and that was like, okay, they're trying to get me where I'm at and they're trying to diminish my reputation actually where I am located. But in the end, People can read that, and anyone who knows me knows that that's completely ridiculous. And it only furthers the argument against what they're trying to say and what they're trying to do against the game. And everything that they do only brings more downloads, more requests for the game. This game at this point is um, being taught in universities. And I mean, it released in October. And just um, yesterday, there were about I think eight or so, maybe more uh, essays uploaded to Facebook, to my own like Thunderbird Strike Facebook group page because there are classes writing articles about the game and reflections. And if you go to the website, there are um, other ways in which you can interact through the process and through the stories. And so it will continue on. And at this point, as with all games, it has a life of its own. And so that's where I'm at with things, is that the Thunderbird has flown on, it's doing its own work, and one aspect which is so vital when you're working with communities of diversity in your games is that if you are going to have diverse representations in your game, you actually involve those people in their own representations, please. Give them proper credit for the roles that they have contributed to the game. And furthermore, that you don't just drop it. Like I made the game and now I'm moving on to the next game. This work is for life. And so Thunderbird Strike, like all of the other games that I've worked on, are for life. And I will do my best to maintain them and continue them on and answer to community members. So thank you, miigwech. And then we'll move on to questions.
questions. My six-year-old is in the back on the iPad, totally silent, which I'm so appreciating right now. I'm like, I made it. So in terms of uh, answering to the elders yeah. involving people, is it that order that the grandmothers or whoever is the most elderly, the grandmothers are the ones who have the loudest voices? Uh, I, yeah, in the way that I was raised, yes. And, and not necessarily the oldest, but, um, you know, being an elder is not something, like a true elder will never say, I am an elder, right? A true elder carries teachings. And so I answer primarily to elders who uh, pass on plant knowledge and medicinal plant knowledge uh, and star teachings as well. And so that will start to appear more and more in the kind of work that I'm doing. And so, yes, um, in that sense. There's also answering to youth, though, because we look seven generations behind us and seven generations ahead. So it's just as much about answering to youth. And so it's a very much um, very much like, you know how uh, in game design you have iterative design, right? And it's cyclical. Very much similar process in terms of um, how we communicate and counsel with one another. Mm -hmm. I sh oh, go ahead. Oh. The way that you would be able to express your particular story and your voice as an artist. Right. Well, I grew up playing games. And I, I'm a gamer, like tried and true, just like really geeky gamer. Like when I was 15 years old, my big thing was like, or yeah, 15, 16, I was like sneaking into popular culture conferences to give presentations about representations in games, because that's what a rebel I am. And, uh, and so I was basically complaining a lot about like how I didn't have characters I got to play that I liked. And like at some point in that, I realized, OK, if I ever actually want to play the kind of game I want or if I want you know, other people even. Because I don't usually depict characters in my games. Like, because I, I tread like very carefully. Like, I don't want anyone to be like playing Indian, you know? And so the kind of avatars that show up in my games are very different. They're either you and you're reflecting out onto the game, or it's like the Thunderbird is actually the first game of my own where you're really, you really see yourself as a player. And so, um, and so I, you know, even encouraging other people to make games. And so it started off like that. Can I make games? Can I like get some other youth who want to make games? And I can help them make games too. And I was actually asked by my community. I grew up um, urban in Portland, Oregon, surrounded by a very mixed community. And there was um, a crew of Anishinaabe people there, but there were also other people. And there was a family, the Bruno family, and they had all sons that wanted to make video games. And so I was asked to run game development workshops. And then I was like, modding games at the time, you know? Like, but everybody's like, you can make games. And I was like, I know how to use the Neverwinter Nights Aurora tool set. <laughs> you know, like it was not, like I was really like making games. And then I was like, oh man, there's like youth who think I can make games. I better be able to make games. And so it just unfolded like that, where it became like answering to the community and really trying to come up with ways to um, empower them as well. And I still continue on that work today. Yeah, youth workshops. Although, side note, I feel like there needs to be a lot more support for like mid-career artists <laughs> because I, and I love doing work with youth, but I think like people who are like past emerging, right? Like if you're past the age or past the point where like you've, you've done work where you're emerging, there's kind of this dropout that happens for the mid-career artists where they're just kind of like, hey, anybody care about me? And everybody's like, no, because surely you've got yourself by now. And then you're like, no, I'm living on my friend's couch, <laughs> you know? And so I feel that there's great work that's happening uh, for the next generations, but I would like to see actually more work also for mid-career artists. That's OK. They're also, it's all chaos now. <laughs> we'll see how long that, now that you've said it, uh, it's all downhill from here. Hey guys, why don't you go out to the hallway if you're going to play that way, okay? No. <laughs> That's my life. Yep.
that's Kat for you. She's six. They um, draw all the time. Like, it's all the time. They're making things and they're designing levels and stuff like that. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Yeah. But um, I am curious about how you think of the relationship between the sovereignty of the designer and the sovereignty of the player. Yeah. So they, like how that interacts, how it's the same, different, that kind of thing. Totally. So when I approach games, I'm tr I'm really trying not to fall into that like god designer mentality, right? So in Thunderbird Strike, you always win. That's like my favorite part of the game. No matter what you do, even if you didn't strike any lightning at anything, you would always at the end win the game. The um, pipeline snake boss at the end will actually deconstruct on its own. Uh, and, but if you don't kill it, the background water gets darker and darker and darker and darker, which you know is expressing the message that oil will spill if we don't take care of this, because it has already actually. There's already been over a million gallons spilled, right? And so, um, and this is like line five specifically, in case that's not clear to some people, underneath the Mackinac Bridge also. And so, uh, yes, that is vital to me, is like understanding the way in, the, in which uh, the player can be autonomous in their decision making. And so to that end, I've done really weird experimental things, which you could play without thumbs. Um, like point and click choose your own adventure musical games where the idea is you're supposed to click through the options and listen to the music as you go along and then you just like hopefully the idea is that you're listening to the music they're done um, so hey guys you need to go out to the hallway okay I'm gonna count to five and you're gonna lose things if you don't okay everybody's looking at you you can exit now or, or calm down, whatever you want to choose to do. So, um, so yeah, in that sense, that's really vital to me. And I think that ultimately that is an ongoing process as a designer. Guys, come on. Thank you. So they love the attention too, by the way. Uh, they're semi accustomed to this at this point. I don't usually take them on big talks like this with me. They'll come into classes sometimes and then they get to goof off, right? Because it's just around students and everything. But yeah, so that's in important to me. I actually have been running um, a series of uh, paper prototyping workshops around the idea of sovereignty. And that's where it comes out a lot more because initially when I created it, I thought it was going to be like only indigenous potential devs and like creators. And so we were playing with this idea of sovereignty in games and certain kinds of game ideas were coming out. And then we started opening up these workshops to all people. And then it was really amazing to see what happened because yes, that's how they interpret the term sovereignty. And so they're creating systems then, systems which allow the player to be very creative or systems which allow um, uh, changes between the player state. So maybe you have like a game which has player one, player two, player three, but player one can become player two or they bec can become player three and like the rotations and turns change. And so very interesting things have been happening with that and I hope to do more of those actually to see what more happens from them. Yeah. So where do you see storytelling Yeah, it's very tricky. Um, I, when I feel that the kind of stories that I'm telling or sharing should not be completely overt, then they're experimental. So all of the animations become experimental then. When, um, you know, when I see other communities doing this kind of work, so Never Alone, how many of you have seen the game Never Alone? So, in that situation, uh, they worked with uh, people who related to those who were part of that original story and had permission from those people. And then uh, it was very self-determined in, in terms that Ishmael Hope, who is a storyteller, worked very closely with the community and 
Um, you know, from what I've been told and from everyone I've spoken to, they're very happy with the game that resulted from it. And so in that sense, it's very important. Now, in some games that I've worked on, uh, like a board game, The Gift of Food, because I do all of it. Like, I love games, and I like interaction, and I like uh, design architecture, like, and spaces, and thinking about spaces. And actually, in my language, it's space, time, one and the same. So it's not space and time separate. It's actually space, time. So that then constructs a lot of how I'm doing the design work that I'm doing. But with that game, The Gift of Food, I worked on that for a year and a half. I thought it was going to shelves. And then it was determined, actually, there was enough plant knowledge in there and food knowledge, which needed to be kept safe from outside communities, that it became a game only for the communities who had worked on it. And that's fine. Now, in a research context, that doesn't look great, right? But that's why I separate out the kind of work that I do, so that there are grants which must have particular deliverables, and there are also community-led projects or sort of smaller budget projects, which you know at the end if someone decides, actually, we don't want anybody else seeing this, it still serves its purpose, because ultimately the purpose is to serve the people. right? Uh, and I think that it's story to story, situation to situation. I will be. Um, Seeing how this unfolds in the next project I'm working on called Along the River of Space Time, which is a virtual reality experience where you learn uh, star stories from bear and medicinal plant knowledge. And uh, in those stories, there are protected stories and there are protected songs. And you're only to tell those stories, not just when snow is on the ground, but when the lake freezes over a particular kind of way. How do you control for that? in a game or a virtual reality experience? Do you say this can only be played at that freezing point? Or what has started happening is that there have been ways in which we are working with the protocol, but then also sharing some of the knowledge. So there is a book of star teachings which share the constellations, but not necessarily directly the stories, so that everyone can begin to recognize the constellations, but then the stories themselves, like the act of oral storytelling, would be preserved for a particular space time. right? And, and so I'll be honoring that in the next project that I work on by having it be the constellations that you're actually interacting with and seeing. Mm -hmm. I just realized I heard you on uh, Oh, cool. Yeah, so awesome. Um, so uh, I'll be up front. I can play video games. I like how everybody's like owning it. <laughs> so this whole idea of creating this repository for um, essential cultural secret and disappearing knowledge is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So have you are you hooked up with uh, people from different cultures who are doing exactly the same thing? I mean, is this beginning to be a, a real means for cultural preservation? Right. Um, I am not as much because I am like managing this all the time and living my life. But my mom is uh, Grace Dillon, and she coined the term indigenous futurisms, which is actually inspired by Afrofuturisms. And so she is much more actually like internationally networked. And she was just in the, in the Netherlands, where apparently they have been playing Thunderbird Strike without like her informing them. So that's a thing that's been happening. And so she like called me up on the phone from the ne Netherlands, and she's like, honey. They're playing your game over here. And I was like, that's cool. And that's grandma's voice. Yeah, that is grandma's voice. He can, he can attest for me. That is grandma's voice. And so um, she's much more networked then. And yes, she's talking to uh, people who do work in Afrofuturisms who are also passing on their star teachings, you know? And they have. Um, potentially like different stories about different planets and then everybody's starting to get together and have conversations about this and internationally there's like amazing kinds of work happening about uh, ways in which we can manage water and land and changes to the environment that are happening and changes with weather, right? And looking at genuine sustainability. The model that's being used at Batchawana First Nation right now, for example, is that you don't just rely on solar power or wind power. <coughs> You do both. So the future is in diversification. It's in multiple designs. It's in not being reliant on one idea and fitting into a silo, but instead expanding out this network. 
and it's going to be more and more vital for us to share with one another culturally. So yes, there's quite a bit of work going on out there. I'm not as aware of it myself because of that. But, and then being like, I have to get tenure and I'm working on my own work and like, you know, I like I said, don't get out much. I do get a lot of work done though because I'm in at night all the time. And so that has been a huge benefit. It was like, you know, people are like, wow, because I'm turning out, um, I've edited three comic anthologies in the last, that are coming out within a like six to seven month time span, for example, right? So there's a lot of other work going on too. And so you can see that kind of work also happening in comics, which is really cool for me to see, you know. So, so yes, there are definitely other people who are looking at it, and quite frankly, much more ahead in terms of actionable change. It's happening here too uh, on reservations. They're uh, at Batchawana First Nation. They are testing a device which goes at the base of your house which uses sound technology to purify water. Now, it is not as ideal as elders have spoken about in uh, communities that I'm a part of. They talk about a time when there will be sound technology which actually can completely convert one type of water state to another type of water state. This device isn't quite there yet, it separates it. So it's like, here's the bad dirty oil or like whatever, kind of like toxic stuff. And then here's the clean water and it runs it through <coughs> the entire building structure. Uh, so there's technology coming out too, right? That could potentially be life changing because if everyone say in Flint, for example, had a device like that, that would separate out and give them clean water, uh, then we would be less reliant on the systems which hinder or hurt particular communities, right? Which is why technology like that is not on shelves. <laughs> but it does exist. It is out there. So there's a great deal of hope, uh, I think, for me, in terms of especially as we're pushing forward design thinking, to understand uh, that there are ways in which actually sound can be a part of our design. Uh, also, liquid technology can be a part of our design, right? There are going to be very rapid changes happening uh, in terms of the speed at which information moves and the kind of technology that we use. Oh, there's like hardcore games. The real well, I mean, deal games. Video game oh, that's very meta. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Uh, uh, um, I have, your last point, you made me think of a new question. So I'll ask that first. When you're starting to talk about or introduce uh, how your work overlaps with technology, how, how and maybe in this larger conversation, How do you navigate that in a way where you are, um, I guess, framing or pushing the conversation rather than being on the other side of the spectrum being framed or being pushed by the conversation or what might technologically frame or, right. or reconcile with your work? Right. Um, I, at some point, like when I was younger, I coded. And then at some point I started going, I like doing the art more. And so I feel limitations. If I were to really um, express a form of sovereignty through game design, I would want us creating our own game engines from the ground up, from the code up. So in that sense then, I really want for us to have new systems. I don't have the capacity for that. I look at like his generation really. Like if someone his age and his generation can see the kind of work that's happening now, if I can do education with them and that's something that they want to build on in the future, it will be them who will really be forming this. So that's my hope is that we will be much more self-determined and as is, I feel like there are definite limitations. 
you know, because ultimately we're still working in somebody else's system. So for example, especially when we're talking about how physics are represented in games, you know, that's being defined by the engine and then we're working within the context of an engine. But what if we could actually express our form of quantum physics? Now having said that, there is the potential for that work to unfold. Um, there was a, a particle system which was discovered, quote unquote, discovered, because that's what scientists like to do. They like to discover things which we've had stories about for many, many, many generations, and which actually shows up as a symbol in a lot of my work. And it represents the potential for teleportation. And so I'm doing work with, um, I'm working on a STEAM or STEM game development workshop for youth right now, where it comes with this sort of like indigenous science module kit, like a play kit, before they make the game. And they're given things like, here's this teaching about teleportation. And then they're like, cool, I want a game that has teleportation in it. And so it's relating indigenous sciences to then what can be game mechanics. And I think that those kinds of conversations what will, will be what will unlock those potential systems. But I don't feel that I actually myself personally have the capacity to do that. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. Which is fine. Like, it's not about me, actually. It's not about me. It's about all of the potential for everybody else's expression, too. <laughs> cool. Quizzions. It's amazing. That's like some quantum physics term we don't know yet. The six year olds, they got it, man. <laughs> talks about this and has for many generations where he was trying to create like a storytelling engine, right? And so he was saying that there's actually this umbrella and that games sit underneath this much wider umbrella, that's how he described it, right? Of all these different forms of interaction. And in fact, that is the case. Now, games are not like distance from indigenous communities. Like uh, there's a reason we have casinos. Actually, it's not just because they make money and we can legally get away with them on reservations. It's actually primarily because we're people of games. Disputes were settled through games. Lacrosse came out of how do we like settle disputes without completely destroying one another? Let's play a game where we kind of sort of destroy each other, but not entirely, you know? And so um, games have actually been a hugely foundational part of our interactions socially within our communities and then also outside. Moccasin Game uh, is a game from my community, which is played very widely uh, and has. Um, important meanings to, to it. And it's still also a gambling game, right? Uh, and then many other kinds of games, which like there's, there are games which would be given to youth, um, like uh, it's kind of like a form of, of hand games. It's uh, one of those kinds of games where you like put something behind your back and you're hiding one piece in one hand and you reveal it in another. It's like a finding game, right? One of those kinds of games. Well, the actual purpose of that game was to teach people how to roll their pipe and stem properly, like how to break those pieces apart and how to roll them, because you would roll the game. And so, um, and then carry it with you and, and you know, take care of it as best you could, and then get in trouble if it didn't work out, right? As a way to prepare you for a future in which you were carrying a pipe. Uh, and so, in that sense, then, there are these ways in which, uh, games and storytelling have always interacted. It's not like anything new in any kind of way. And so I really look to, in some of my games, uh, actually the mechanics are inspired by traditional games as well. So I think that there are certainly ways in which, but then we also have to be mindful that this gets outmoded. You know, 
like let's be real here, uh, games, games go, you know? And so like how do we keep up with those changes? That's something that's going to be really important to keep in mind is like how can we actually, we can't really treat this as an archivable work, I don't feel like. Certainly there are people who are like, we're gonna archive all the games and keep them and libraries do that kind of work and it's amazing. But I think we also need to accept uh, some kind of form of impermanence to games and malleability in that and understanding that we are always changing. And so were uh, our, our communities, right? There's no hard and fast like tradition with a capital T and that's the way it always should be. It was actually a conversation. And that's something that is very often uh, misunderstood about the way in which, at least, um, I know that from my own community. I can't speak on behalf of all indigenous communities, but I know that um, for Anishinaabeg, that was never the way. You know, it wasn't like this is the rule, the only rule, the only one way. It was a conversation, and that there can be changes. And so, games very much fit into that. Then, can storytelling change over time? Yeah, for sure, absolutely, and will continue to. Okay, and I think with that, they're probably like quiet at the moment, but there's gonna be an explosion, there might be a fire, I don't know what might happen, so I think we'll end it there, but I'll be here. So thank you very much, Miigwech, for taking time to be here tonight. Do you like your drawing?